Everything I'm going to show you is not because I am a FileMaker expert and this is the way you should do CMSs. It's, um, I come to DevCon because I like talking about the things we do and when you hear how other people do things or when they react to what you're doing, then you can go home and make things even better. So I'm hoping it just kind of starts the conversation. And uh, my email address is really easy to figure out. It's Dave underscore Dumas at FileMaker or Claris.com. And uh, we can keep the conversation going. I am either the world's dumbest genius or the world's smartest dumb person at all times, as you're about to see. So I'm going to go ahead and fire in the hole. Um, we are looking at web content management with FileMaker. So who am I? I am Dave Dumas, and I joined Claris, really, actually Claris. In 1996, I was part of tech support. This is FileMaker 3 had just been released, which was relational. And we had over 70 tech support agents back then, and it was free to call. So people would call and talk about their database. Hey, how do I find the difference of days between two dates? How do I make a report? How do I print out? And so you, I didn't know, so I was taking calls, and I learned so much in a year. And when you hit the help desk, you're getting people like Ben Miller and John Mark Osborne and all the great luminaries of FileMaker were all working, a lot of them were working in uh, tech support back then. So it was a real great education. I moved to the burgeoning web team in 1998. This is when we decided, hey, bullet board, bulletin boards are great, but how about uh, having a website? So there was no CSS, and we just kind of made it work. Immediately, though, I started using FileMaker. Uh, the tech support uh, knowledge base was in FileMaker, so I just uh, published it out and been using it ever since. I am a lifelong musician. Any musicians, people who play music, all right? Anybody do magic when you're a kid? Card tricks? All right, you feeling me. Um, the, uh, I found when I worked in tech support, a lot of guys had done magic or had been musicians, and it's the connecting of the creative and the technical side that I think makes you an excellent FileMaker database person, because you have to be creative. I hope so. I toured Montana with Yanni. It was different buses and different bands, but it was the same tour. And Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming, does anybody remember who Yanni was? Is, is, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, we were doing top 40 music back then, so uh, it was a little different, but it was fun. Um, and that's my music career. 1986, I got a job at Guitar Player Magazine. And I loved Guitar Player Magazine. I loved pouring over the articles since I was real young. They started in 1967 in my hometown. And uh, I poured over it. And so I had the opportunity to get a job there doing advertising. And so when I came in, what their magazine starts like, and oh, by the way, I don't really have 11,000 slides. It was just my little joke. I'll stop doing that. Okay, so when I came in, it was a bunch of physical boards. This is a cartoon, but this is what they look like. So when uh, we were going to make the magazine, the editors would be working on their K-Pros, and then they would take the disc to the key setter, and they would go into this big machine that would put out these strips of super, the whitest paper I've ever seen, with the text on it. Then the art director would take a razor blade and cut it up, and then with wax, put it on the boards, ship it off, and then it, they would photograph it to publish the magazine. And I fell in love with publishing. I realized that's what I wanted to do. It's why I get up in the morning. It's why I stay late with no one asking. It did everything that I love creating from the creative process to showing it to people. It's like performing. So I fell in love with publishing, and being at FileMaker has allowed me to keep doing that. So I'm going to, this is, this is a lot. So we're going to go overview how we're using CMS on FileMaker. We're going to talk about templating. We're going to talk about content entry versus data entry. We're going to use, anybody thought about using a WYSIWYG editor in FileMaker? Does that sound good? Are you doing it already? Well, let's do it. You're all going to be doing it today. All right. Let's get fired up. OK, we're going to look at JSON-LD. You don't think this is exciting. This is going to blow your mind. Uh, getting content out of FileMaker, and this is new features for AT, so it's a very timely session. We use uh, as a CMS in three main ways. We manage content that will be fed into a third-party system. This is like shipping our events off, you know, by region into the Marketo system or somewhere else where it's going to be used. 
Uh, dynamically served data from a database. We don't do this a lot, but like made for FileMaker is a live database connection uh, that you are looking at solutions. And, uh, and we also manage content and upload it via SFTP to our web servers. So image, HTML, JavaScript files. That is the method that has been most beneficial and is most widespread across our site. So I figured that'd be a good area for us to focus on today. Uh, we don't make online database interfaces. That's not what it's about. When I talk about a publishing, I don't want to be doing some kind of data direct where you're looking at a database, because that's not, we want to prov provide really good web content. Um, made for FileMaker is almost like a database. Uh, we do not manage the entire site in a CMS. We did try it a couple times. Most sites tried it at the turn of the century. We tried it a couple of times. And we found it far too restrictive. If you have every page, when we have our product pages, we want to kind of have this unique perspective and expression every time we release the project. But if we had a university with, you know, a thousand professors all writing a blog or their syllabuses, it would make complete sense to have it all in there. But we, got, we want a little bit more flexibility. So we pick our spots. Where could we benefit from having a CMS to help us when we change our name in the middle of the night? Uh, where can we get a real advantage? Because otherwise, it's really not worth doing. And how, I mean, isn't that every FileMaker customer story? We had a big system. It wasn't working for us. I started fooling around with FileMaker, and now they fell in love with it, and we're FileMaker people. It's every story. So what we found is we got easier localization. We allow count on owners to regularly update their, so they are, they're empowered, and it also, which helped the web team get out of the line change business. They don't want to, almost out of, my web team is here, and they're, they're gonna, there we go. Um, they, uh, um, they don't want to be making line changes, and it really allows them to concentrate on making our site look so great, and up to, you know, full Apple standards, and then we'll also publish content managed by traditional backend databases. So find a partner and our events. Those are, those are already databases that are behind the scenes. And I just need to find a way to express it to get that information out to you guys. So where do we use it? Well, our navigation and our footer. This seems like a really good candidate. This looks like data to me. Um, so it's a real easy way for us to create the uh, navigation and also be able to do it for all the different languages that our sites work in and all the different sites we have. Uh, customer stories, great way to manage those. I don't want to be hand coding those every time we get a new customer story. Press releases, CMS, and the Custom App Academy. I don't know if you've had a chance to check it out. I really recommend it. There's great lessons on how to use FileMaker right on our website. And this, boy, this seemed like a great opportunity uh, for a CMS. We're going to look at that a little bit more in depth. Uh, find a partner. I mentioned it. You go to find a partner. You put in your zip code, and you do a search, and you find all the other uh, uh, consultants that are near you, and you're not hitting a database. You're, that's, I, just preside, I present all the information in a JSON, and then we have a client-side app that is running to find you, and it, it uh, puts you know, the center of your zip code to the center of their zip code, but it's pretty good. Events. Also, you can come and see what events are happening. We had some good, this will tie into JSON LD. And meta. Every page, especially in our product area, has to have meta code. Uh, and this is code for your title, your description, and it also has open graph tags so that you can talk to uh, Google and other web engines uh, so that they'll properly recognize you. Well, if you have these meta codes in all of the HTML pages, if you ever want to say, I wonder if our meta tags are good. Am I going to open every page? And what if I want to make a, a common update to all of them? then I'm going to have to have all these pages open up and remember which ones I've changed. It would be a complete nightmare. So our web team came up with a great idea. Of put, why don't we put it into a database so that we can immediately look at all our meta tags, make an adjustment, and when you publish, they're all updated. Uh, this is an example of the JSON that I create for the Find a Partner. It has their name and also has their latitude and longitude. On the back end, I do a little web service that builds out from their address, their latitude and longitude, and then uploads that so that it can be easily looked at through the online, through the client-side web app. When I say client-side, I mean JavaScript, working once it's on your computer. You guys are savvy. Templating, HTML and JSON. So, um, 
What do I look at when I see a page of how I'm going to actually do it with a CMS? Um, I want to know, is it regularly updated? If so, by whom? Is, are they people who are used to working with computers? I've had people who aren't used to working with computers and it didn't go well. Um, uh, and if it's not updated very regularly, maybe, maybe a CMS is too heavy. Is it highly templatable? Um, how much of the page needs to be managed in the CMS? Uh, do I need to do the entire page? Or perhaps could I get by with an a little include? For our navigation, I'm just making an include. So the rest of the page can be managed by the web team independently. Um, is there content being authored in FileMaker or is it being brought in? So are they going to be in my CMS creating this? Am I going to need to help them? Um, by creating perhaps some WYSIWYG? Um, or is it just a back-end database and I just need to make sure I understand how the data is formatted so that I can get it out? What about localization translation? Do I need to consider that it's going to be in Japanese and Korean? What about the things I can't see, like the meta tags or our analytics track? We use Adobe Analytics. I have to code each page. Uh, are those considerations I need to do? So when I look at this page, this is a finished design for the Custom App Academy. And I, I look at a couple of things when I'm considering doing the CMS. Uh, first in the top left, I can see I've got this nice little left-hand nav. And that feels like a database to me, where I have these lessons and I go through and I can compile this left-hand nav and put it out as an include file. And then I see two sections where I go, oh, that looks like good content that people can do authoring. And they have some links in there. It'd be good to have some WYSIWYG. And then I look at everything in the green, and I see these feel more like a template thing. They're not each overview record for this is going to always have the same things on it. So these are things that can be in the template. And then I also, uh, if I'm going to be doing this in other languages, I'm going to need to have the word what to expect in Japanese and Korean, whatever language I'm going to be uh, localizing in. So I'm going to want to consider that, and I'm going to show you how we handle that. Getting that forward and back, boy, that seems like something I could create in a database. Uh, here's our brand new marketplace. Anybody have a chance? Oh, you don't. Do you know you can go to the marketplace? It's a public beta. It's stagingmarketplace.filemaker.com. That's stagingmarketplace.filemaker.com. And uh, you can check out all of the over 100, 150 solutions that we have up there now. And when I looked at this page, I thought, you know, all I really need to do is the featured listings for this part of the page because I don't need to do the entire page. I can just create an include file that'll work within that page, so making it a little bit more lightweight for me to, to publish to. So templating. So I have this finished HTML design. How am I going to get my data into it? So I want to start with a fully designed version of the temporary content. Uh, this is really important. I always am tempted to think, oh, well, it's mostly designed. I'll go ahead. I kind of know, and so I'll go ahead and start working on it. And I recommend don't do it because I end up working on a one-week project for three weeks because I just work on it in chunks. I wait till the end. And I also recommend um, if it's going to be localized, do make sure your designer does a version in German and Japanese. Um, it's a really good idea. German words are really long. Japanese is a really different um, aesthetic. So you want to make sure your design holds up to be localized before you get started. Um, I also recommend French, because French is sometimes really, uh, we were doing one where we had a home button, and that's when I uh, came to know that there is no single word for home in French. I believe it translates to place where I keep my socks. And I'm French. Um, so nothing blows up a beautiful design like real data. Uh, this is not something you can prevent. Uh, once you have your design, it's all approved. Once you slide in real data, it's not, it's not going to go well. And there's nothing you can do about it, so don't feel bad. You haven't failed. This is part of the exciting process of creating a CMS. And you should build some time in your schedule because I keep looking at Angela. She's one of my lead designers. <laughs> Nobody look at her. She must not be looked at. Because some of these things are, are all things that, that we're used to doing. Uh, and, and so it's just the way it goes. And don't be surprised. And just have a couple of extra days in your schedule to uh, redeal with the CSS padding and everything that needs to happen to make it look good. You haven't failed. Uh, you can do templating a calc, 
but I recommend more of a code merge template. I don't know if that's the word to use. We used to do mail merge. Maybe some of you still do mail merge emails. And so, that's a com- so I applied that term. But when I'm, when I'm looking at doing it, I often think of Guitar Player Magazine and of CSN, CSS Zen Garden. Has anybody seen the CSN Garden Garden? All right, a couple of people. You should all have a bookmark because it's really awesome. Glasses on. Um, so the Zen Garden, the content, if you notice it says Road to Enlightenment, Littering a Dark and Dreary Road. If I look at the code, um, I can see Road to Enlightenment is a H3 tag and just a regular par- paragraph tag, Dark and Dreary Road. This is the most vanilla HTML ever. It has a class and ID for every section, but it is made to be super vanilla so that you can apply any CSS template to it. And I'm gonna go ahead and choose a couple different. I'll choose Mid-Century Modern. Mid-Century Modern. This is a completely different page, but the exact same content, Road to Enlightenment, littering. And if I look at the HTML code, it's identical. So I'm not changing the code, I'm just applying different CSS. Let me try another one, garments. And it's impeccable quality. And then my current favorite, a robot named Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. All right. Um, So when I'm ever creating an output, when I'm ever creating, and I'm always ever creating, I always want to keep the CSN garden always in my mind because that's my gold standard. I want it to look, my code, to look that good. So let me take a brief second to talk about our CMS flow. Um, We start with the web design, as I mentioned, and I have a templates table where I store the templates for the different areas, and I like having them in a template table, and I like being able to keep versioning of them. That way, I always have something to roll back to in case we uh, have made a mistake, and it's also something where my designer could log into and actually make adjustments to the templates. I do have a language uh, table next to that, and the language table allows me to take those terms I mentioned, like what's new or what's happening, that are gonna apply to my solution and just have them translated for every language that I can then call on while I'm doing this merge. And then in the purple, I have the solution table. I make a new solution table for every different module that I make, uh, but they all use the same templates database and they all look at the same language so I have a real centralized way of publishing and then once the solution table will uh, for the user they see that and uh, and they'll request to publish but that just sends their code up to my publishing queue up on the right I don't want them publishing from their computer and having any type of FTP access I want my publishing engine to do that so it takes the request they may have compiled the HTML to send it up there or it may be a complex like publish everything for Custom Academy where it'll publish all the lessons and then it's just doing kind of a job but that way my publishing engine can do its job and they're freed up on their computer to continue working and then the publishing queue has the ability to publish out so you can template with a calc Um, But I don't recommend it. I put carriage returns in this one, and they said, is the screen okay? Okay. Oh, is everybody, it's two, oh my gosh, it's three o'clock on a Wednesday. Let's get fired up. Let's get fired up. Let's get fired up. Don't leave me alone. Let's get fired up. Everybody. Oh boy. Oh boy. (laughs) So (laughs) that, that worked. Um, So here's a calculation. I have carriage returns to make it a little easier, but my designer doesn't want to see this. It's got, has escaped out um, quote marks, and they can't really edit this in a meaningful way. I just don't find it's very effective. What I like is just having an HTML file with little replacement tags. This is an HTML file. This is for the Custom App Academy, and I have these little tags, like this field lesson title, field course, And uh, these will get replaced as I'm creating the page. That way, this is something my designer could totally look at and know exactly what's going on, make a recommendation to change some code, or actually make the change themselves. It has, here's my uh, code that is for my Adobe Analog, Adobe Analog, Adobe Analytics. Um, And so that way I can code that directly in the page and make it a little bit easier to track. Does that make sense? Yes. 
so now that I have this great replacement code, how am I going to get my data in there? And it's just a good old fashioned substitute. I get my uh, lesson template and then I go through each one of those tags and replace it, much like I would with a merge calc for a uh, email. And right here on this line, I have the language for templates file and uh, that where I have a relationship where I can go get my localized words. So the point where I want to pull in something, a translation, I can. Other than that, I'm just getting data from the actual record. Uh, content entry versus data entry. We used to really struggle about 10 years ago with, with helping people understand the difference between content and data. And I pulled those slides out because uh, I'm out of time, but also because I feel like everybody's had a, uh, an idea of working with web content and websites. They realize it's different than an actual database. But the way you enter the data could be really important. So when you come to our website and you look at our software downloads, um, you see something that looks very much like a form, like a tabular data. So it would make sense you'd want to enter data like this, whereas you come to our customer stories page, you see something that's really contextual. All of these words and pictures are going to uh, matter how they're used on this story. So here is the actual CMS, and this is for our nav and footer, and as you can see, it looks a little like our navigation. You can see across the top the things, your pull downs, and then the items that are within the pull downs. And as I zip through here, I can do my platform items, I can do my company items, I can do my support items, I can go through each of my languages and update them. And then when I'm done, I can publish it out to any one of six different servers so I can finish all my testing. So real handy and real uh, adds context even though it's tabular. Uh, for support downloads, we just took a look at the page. This is what the interface looks like. This is tech support people. They know databases, so they wanted something that looks like a database, and it really does. They have the ability to put in the version and the platform, and then they can uh, open the pop-up and put in the actual location of the download file and the article. I always like to include test buttons. Uh, that way they can actually, when they put it in, it's always going to be the wrong address, and it gives them a chance to test it in a browser and make sure that they catch the air. Uh, they have the ability to change the order of them, and then they can publish to staging or a prod server so they have a chance to see it uh, before, it's, uh, before it's live. Um, customer stories. Um, let me go, actually, bring that one up. Come on now. I see I have a hero graphic, then I have a graphic to the left and a little text over to the right, a pullout quote. And so when they're authoring, I thought it was a really great idea if their interface looked like a customer story. That way they uh, has some context and they kind of catch their own airs before they even publish. All the stuff that shows up on the right hand side is there. They got their picture, it's positioned even on their layout so they can see it. They can see the second image will be positioned on the right. So they get a little bit, it's almost, it's almost like a giant weird WYSIWYG uh, that they can work on. So we have our uh, test drive using sample apps. Let me look at this. This is um, one of our custom app academy. I can see I go down here and I actually have a, uh, a video and I want to have different versions of the video because maybe they're on an iPad and I want a higher quality if they've got a high resolution screen. So I come in and it looks a lot like that and I can go ahead and put in different versions. In fact, let me go ahead and since I've been talking about WYSIWYG, I'll give you a little preview of what that looks like. So I will, this is my uh, dashboard which I can see all my recent publish requests and all of the, uh, whoop, I gotta change my language. All of the uh, solutions I have access to. I'm gonna go to learning and select that lesson so as I come down, I can see my overview, and then I can see I have a place to put as many versions as I want. With the JavaScript, it controls what kind of resolution I have and what gets shown. And then I have this concept covered, and I can click on here, and now I'm in a WYSIWYG editor. This is your future, and your immediate future. And I go, you know what? I don't want this to be numbers. I want it to be bullets, and I don't like that being bold. Or you know what? Yeah, I don't like it. And when I save changes, it goes back into the field, and what you're seeing here is actually a web viewer showing you the HTML code. Is that pretty cool? Mind-blowing? All right, we're building. We're not fired up quite yet, but we're getting there. All right. Um, I'm not coming across needy at all. 
All right. I demoed. All right, we're ready. WYSIWYG in your FileMaker interface. WYSIWYG? Is it a hidden feature in FileMaker Pro 18? Save your answers. Is it a mix of JavaScript library and lots of Diet Coke and Chex Mix? Hint. Or is it part of the feature set for the new FileMaker Cobra version? Anybody have your answer? It's Claris Cobra. No, it's actually Chex Mix and, and, um, and Diet Coke. And, but I've taken care of it for you, so we've made it easy for you. And I say we for, for a specific reason. So we want, uh, growing, we, we want people to be able to put in TinyMC. When I said when we used one of those CMSs at the turn of the century, they had a feature that took care of this, and I, tr I wanted to use it so bad. I could taste it. It's called TinyMCE. This is an open source, free to use. Uh, they do have new licensing models. If you have a website viewed by a million people and they're doing editing, that's what their license models. But for just using it yourself, you're in the clear. We're going to look at TinyCloud. And uh, they have on their features list, they have this is a HTML text area. And they powered with their plugin code. And so I can go right in here and test typing. And I can select this. And I can make it an H3. Let me get this up so the people in the back can see. And I can make it bold or make it italic. So now I'm editing. Uh, and, it, and I could add a link. Uh, now I'm editing within this window, and I thought, wow, well, we have web viewer windows in FileMaker. This is right after they were created, by the way. And I said, what if I could scrape that out? Then I could use it. Well, I had a demo for that, but you don't want to see it because it doesn't work. Uh, there are some unique idiosyncrasies with Apple WebKit, and I would consider them a bug. They do not. Uh, they will not fix them. So I wasn't able to do it within a web viewer for the longest time. So I created a, uh, a system that would take your database, take the field, put it into a web-enabled database, and then open up the page uh, with you know, JSP code that would allow you to edit it and send it back into the database. And, and so it worked, and we had it. But nobody should do this. And you don't have to because you're about to buy a hat and then you're going to hold on to it. So I was super complaining all the time about this not working and super uh, proud of my efforts to create this thing. And I would always talk to my friend Mike Gaslowitz, who is an amazing developer, and I would just call and complain about how I can't get Apple to fix the web viewer. And so when FileMaker made uh, the RESTful API to be able to call scripts in a URL, and call, and if you call it on the machine you're on, um, it'll run a script of the database you have open. He says, you know, Dave, you can just do this. And he sent me the code. And it's like I didn't want to even look at it. I had so much emotionally invested in it not working. I didn't want to hear that it could be so easy with a new feature. And he was right. Uh, so all we want to do is create a script. We start with FMP. And then we have a dollar sign, which just tells the API, hey, uh, on the database you have open on this machine. Then we give it the file name, we give it the script name, and then we send two variables. One is the field name that we want it to uh, work on, and then the value that we want it to send. And that's all there is to it. Uh, so all we need to make it work in your file is an HTML template that has the tiny MCE called. We're going to get a web viewer window, and we're going to make a script. So fire in the hole. So I start off with HTML, and I have this in a field. Now, the HTML is just going to make a web viewer window that has a text area. That's all you're going to really see is a text area and a Save Changes button. So the first thing I do is I load in the tiny MCE code. This is loading it off of their CDN, which you can try. You, when you download this course off of their website, you will get all these example files, and you can go nuts. So you're going to load this in. And then I'm going to uh, set the options for the tiny MCE. They have tons of options on their, um, 
on their website. Here I'm setting up a very basic WYSIWYG where I just have a couple of plugins and I have a toolbar. You, I'll let you choose bold and italic, letting you make a numbered list or a bulleted list. And then I'm setting the height to be 275. Uh, now, I have my form down here in which I'm just setting the text area name to be my field and setting the, the actual data for my field into the text area. And then here's my function I call when you hit the save button. And all it's loading in dynamically, this is going to be in a calc you're going to see in two seconds. Um, it's going to load in the file name, the script name I want to use, the field, and it's going to call this, uh, this function right here the tiny MCE get content. This is part of their API, and this is what does the scraping. So you don't even have to do the scraping. Tiny MCE will do it. And then it compiles, puts together that URL we just saw, where I have the script and the two field, the two variables for field and value. Let's take a look at it in action. So I have here my uh, web viewer, and I've set it to load in my template. Whoop! load in my template, and then I replace out those little variables with my uh, field name of my content field, my file name, the script that I want to run. I'll show you that in a second. And then I load in the content from the field. So it should be replacing the content from my field in there at all times. So I'll look at that, and I notice if I put in some extra exclamation points over here, it shows up over there, because it's just loading it in from that calc. So I'm going to look at the script, and I am going to do one script step, which is set field by name, and I'm going to do the field, and I'm going to set it to the variable that I'm passing, and the value is going to be the value variable I've passed. So super, super easy, right? So let's see it in action. I don't want those, and I don't want it to be bold. Let me see. I'll select it all. I don't want you to be bold. And I'm going to save the change. Or did I bold it? Nope, I did unbold it. <coughs> but it's not into the microphone. <coughs> cough drops make me cough. Um, pretty cool. Let's take a moment and just allow ourselves to appreciate what we've just seen. There we go. We've just shared. I can feel it. I can feel it. You're saying, Dave, this is too easy. And yes, it's too easy. Um, so here's a calculation for you to peruse at your leisure where you can actually see what's happening behind the scenes in the web viewer window. And you can see where it is replacing out the names of my file, my script. You can see the actual content that's currently in it. And you can see everything that's being replaced. So it's real easy to uh, put into your site. Now, when I put it in my sites, I like to do it this way. I have added a couple of scripts. I have added an open window, which opens up a card window, which I just have the web viewer on that layout, and then uh, with a height, and then I have my save. All I've done is add a close window step after setting the field. So I've just made a real simple change, and you get something that is going to blow people's mind. You're going to come back, and sh people will love you. Um, so when you click on it, it opens a window, a card window, and now I can make my edits, and it's going to save it back to my file, and there you go. Now here, okay, I, I didn't break for applause, but so uh, another FileMaker, this is a great FileMaker um, quiz. When you have admin privileges to a file, what is the only case you will get a message saying you do not have access to this file? Don't feel bad, because I forget this all the time. So if you do not have security turned on in your admin for, come on, clicking. If you don't have it turned on for allow URLs to perform FileMaker scripts, you will get the you do not have access. And as of FileMaker 17, it defaults to off. So when you get my file, it's going to magically work. And when you try it on your file, you're going to say, Dave, what's the deal with, a posit, with a permissions? So that's, uh, that's your fun fact. You can be limited in a full access file. Sure. Now, 
Dave, that's a simple example. What if I'm a, web, what if I'm a database professional? That's a really good question. I'm going to show you the professional version made by my friend Mike Gaslowitz. This is a chance for all of you to have a personal moment with Michael and his genius. Um, so it looks a lot the same. You have the web viewer window here where I can edit and you can save the changes, but it gives you a lot more information. Uh, first of all, he has a link to the tiny MCE documentation. He has uh, information on how to, con you can actually turn that into uh, fields you can edit. Right now he's actually hosting his code off of uh, his GitHub, but you can put in your, your uh, where you're hosting TinyMCE here. You have a, a way to customize the implementation. You can see the HTML template, a little, little bit more robust web viewer calc. And then this great sample integration. So you can export this file out of this container field and you have back to more of a hello world like mine where it calls this more full featured version and you can actually implement uh, this really great version into your solution. So you're getting that absolutely for free for sitting in the first 10 rows. You're on the brink. Okay, so get it, learn it, love it, live it. Okay, let's look at JSON-LD. When I say JSON-LD enough time, I will often accidentally reference country rock music superstar Jason Aldean. Just what I do, and uh, so I may, if you hear me say Jason Aldean, I'm not talking about music, I'm talking about code. Uh, so it is JavaScript object notation for linked data. Uh, it can be used for lots of stuff but we use it for search engine optimization. So we want to be noticed on Google, and this helps us do it. You can add context to the data. That, so Google's just searching your page, trying to make sense of it, and it's a way for you to make this case, here's what this page is about. You should rank us really high. Um, if you build using guidelines from schema.org, it's uh, the, you will get rewarded. That's what they're looking for. And schema.org is part of the W3C, and it's an amazing site. Uh, so if you, uh, if you go to your Google right now, uh, at least when I did this test, and you put, I dropped my iPhone in water, you will get this response. And it's, as soon as you type it in, you don't get a link to a site. You get quick, get it out of the water. And <laughs> turn it off, leave it off. This is helpful. Um, iPhoneLife.com loves this because they get right to the top of the search results. And Google loves this because you don't leave Google and Google doesn't ever want you to leave Google. And so if you're willing to live with this relationship, you can get some really good, um, really good placement on Google. So all they did is they added a JSON-LD expression of the page from schema.org, this is their code. Um, and they also did some other coding in the page that I will, I will go over. Uh, so if you go to schema.org, it is a super helpful way to help you create these great pieces of content to have on your site. Like I went in there and I looked up events because I wanted to do our events page and I see there is a thing called an event and it has lots of different properties. If I go through the properties, I can see, look, oh, they have a, a, a property location and I can code it this way. But even better than that, they give you great real world examples. So this is one of the four examples they give you for events. And I have a very simple event with a date and the venue and the address and a link to the site. And then it shows me how to code it using microdata. And this is the way that iLife did it. They also included microdata into their site. You can see it's just added a couple extra tags in the middle of your code to help, um, it, first of all, it starts by telling Google that you're using schema.org events, and it organizes in a way that Google can compile it and reward you. It also shows you how to do it with RDF, also read by Google, or you can do it the way we do it, which is JSON-LD. What I love about JSON-LD is that I don't have to do anything to my markup on my page at all. I can just create this nice package and have it you know, at the top or the bottom of the page, and Google will read that and hopefully reward me. So I did. We had the challenge, I want to get events located in a, in a wonderful way on Google. So let me create a JSON-LD for each one of my events, make, build a list of all our events, and I'll throw it on the page and see what happens. And success! You come in, you see events at FileMaker, and then you see these events. Let me show you in action. 
even though we're going to lose a couple of people. Some people are going to pass out because of the extreme energy of the room. Okay, so I go, I'm in Google, and I go, oh, let's see, see more events. And as I click to the events, I see this building off to my right. Let me make it a little bigger here. And there we go. Um, and I can see I have a map to the event. I can get directions immediately. I am getting data from meetup.com about that's the, where the event is being held at meetup.com. They know that. They've gone, they, they, have, they have actually crawled meetup.com before. And so they have that data. They put it together for me. I couldn't make something like this without a lot of Diet Coke and Chex Mix. Uh, is that pretty cool? Again, there we go. Um, it's, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely free. I'm so close to making it. Okay. We're going to get the content out of FileMaker. This is some new features in 18. Here's the deal. I want to upload all the stuff to my server, but FileMaker, it's called FileMaker. And that's one thing that it really doesn't actually do. It doesn't really make a with the files at all. It's great for creating databases and creating things, but if you go to export HTML file, you won't find it. You'll get export as an HTML table, but that's not what you want. Uh, so I would create merge files and rename them. Uh, but you, so you could make it work, and we've all made it work. We all have learned to appreciate the fun tips and tricks you do to make FileMaker create what you want to create. Uh, when export from field feature came out a few versions ago, I go, oh, now I don't have to go through each record and, 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 and systematically, I can just go uh, out of the individual fields, but it's UTF-16 only, and I need UTF-8, so I was a little disappointed. Uh, so I built an ecosystem of robots uh, that use AppleScript, and they're FileMaker robots, they weren't actually robots. I'll be honest with you. Um, so I use Apple scripting, and so I was, very, again, like the crazy WYSIWYG solution I made, I was super proud of it. But it's, it's terrible. Why would you want to do that? And you don't have to, uh, because we have plugins. And so plugins came to my rescue. We have an amazing community of plugin developers, and there was lots of help uh, for creating the files locally, and that made me really excited. But what if I wanted to upload directly from my database uh, file to, uh, to my server, directly from my fields, because that's what I want. Or better yet, what if I could upload from a variable? What if I had an image in my database and I use FileMaker's image sizing uh, step and I size a thumbnail and upload that, uh, I would be uploading things that don't even exist. It'd be really cool. Uh, so we implemented 360 Works FTP. I am not a paid advisor or paid spokesman for FTP. You can do a, num a number of things. This happened when we've been using it for about eight years with great success. And this is how easy it is. I have FTP, form a connection, which they give you lots of demos on how to do. And then once I'm connected to my server, I simply do one script step of FTP, uh, can't say it, I upload file from field, and then I set the destination of what directory I want to load it into. And then I've built my code up in a variable. So I could put in a field name here if I want. And then I get to set it to UTF-8. And that is the happiest part of, of the whole thing. And then I set a little error, just in case I do get an error. Um, but I generally don't get too many errors because I'm already connected to my server at this point. So pretty easy. So really, don't go give them a hug because uh, uh, what they've done for me is, has been life-altering. So eight years of that, and then finally we get in uh, FileMaker a curl. So now I can actually do it from within FileMaker. Uh, I can upload from a variable. In fact, you can't upload a file on your computer with curl because that's against the rules. So I'm going to upload it uh, using curl. I would need two hours to show you how to do curl. And Steve Winter has done a much better job. And I have this link in here. And he can just how to do with it, because there's a steep learning curve. It's a nomenclature. It's a thing. But for me, I'm not quite ready because I need SFTP. And we don't, we're not supporting it quite yet. Um, we do FTPS, but my server doesn't support it. So I'm in no man's land where I'm still using the FTP for a little while. But there is a plugin, as I saw just before I was putting my um, together. Monkey Bread has a software to do curl the SFTP, so you can give that a whirl. 
But what if I want to actually just create the files? I've got two great new features, export container. So I'm exporting field, but exporting out the container, and export field contents is real. I have data file script steps. When I first heard about data file script steps, I thought it meant that um, I was, I was uh, creating data files. Like uh, I was creating a file that could be used like a cookie on my user's computer, which sounded viable, sounded like a great thing to have. Um, but I didn't realize one thing I found out recently, when they say data file, they literally mean anything that isn't a FileMaker file. So data file isn't a specific thing. It's HTML, it's TXT, it's JSON, it's JS, it's anything you want it to be. So let's take a look at it. And it may be the easiest one yet. So I have two fields in this export database, which is part of your package. I have content, which is just a text field. And then I have my calc for content. And I'm going to go ahead and take a look at it. Maybe I should zoom, make it a little bit bigger. So text encode, don't get seasick, text encode. Um, has three things you add to it. You have the, uh, what you want to encode, which I have set as my field. Uh, the encoding is UTF-8, which we know. That is my middle name. Line endings is set to three, as uh, three is the code for Unix or um, OS X uh, line endings. And, boop, it, calculation result is a container. This is the mojo. So when I have my script, it is just going to export out Export, exporting out field contents, and it's going to grab that calc, I mean the uh, calculated uh, container field. I'm setting the name of where it's, of where it's going to be, it's going to create it on my desktop in an export folder. Yep. And then um, I'm going to have it automatically open. I'm going to save it, and let's run it, and it opens it up. And I can see it has created the world's easiest uh, HTML page. And if I look at my desktop, I can see it sitting right here, my export folder. Pretty cool? It, 18 versions. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not bitter about it at all. So I'm going to do my second one. We're going to create, has anybody created data files yet? All right, a couple of people, you will be creating them the rest of your life because you're empowered now, because it's great. So they're a little tricky until this session. Okay, so I'm, the first thing I'm gonna do is create a variable, and I'm gonna set it to be uh, dollar sign, dollar sign ID. Doesn't have to be a global variable, I just like it. Um, and I'm creating it here so that I'm not throwing, at, throwing it at you sometime in, in the rest of the script to make it really clear. So I create the data file, and Huh? I'm zooming. Okay. You got it. <laughs> when the guy in the front row says I need to zoom, he's the only one I'm listening to, not the people who are... Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to create it in my same export folder. Sorry. There's a way of zooming that doesn't do this. Anyway, um, I create the data file. So that's saying I'm going to be creating the data file with this name. And then I'm going to open the data file so I can work on it. When you open it, you have to give it, it has a target. And that's where I'm going to store the, the ID of the file. This is how, so like when you open something in Word, it's open in Word. And if you try and get at it with another program, it may warn you, hey, 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 Word's got it. So this ID thing is how FileMaker has it in its kind of internal memory saying, this is file number one. I know it's that one that he's working on his, on his desktop folder. So that's how FileMaker remembers what it is. So it's now in FileMaker, in its memory, and it's my data file test.html. And I'm going to write to this data file using the write to data file script step. And now I'm going to, uh, one of the options I have is to choose the file ID. I'm just going to put that great variable that I have in. So it's in there. And then I'm going to, um, the field I'm going to put into this data file is my content field, my other field. And I'm going to write as UTF, which I have a history of liking. And then I'm going to close the data file. 
And by here now, I'm just referencing it as the ID. It knows where it's located already. So it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So when it runs, I know. And I should see, now I have my data file test. And if I open it up and I view the source, I see it's exactly what I want it to be. Huh? Pretty good? All right. Hopefully that encourages you to do some good data file work. And believe it or not, I finished on time. We did all this stuff. Is that pretty good? Oh, man. This is brutal. That was, this is a high energy session. So I can, uh, no updates, it's all there. I have the answers to the evaluation questions. I can help you out. Does anybody have any questions? All right. No, because what's there is what you just saw. I don't think I have the Claris Cobra logo in there. So uh, I didn't want that to be in the general domain. Uh, right in front of you, yep. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Uh, because I have people using FileMaker on Windows all the time. Uh, and my server is on Windows, so I know the publishing side should work. But if not, 1-800-DAVE. Uh, yeah, look again. No, for, to run on, the question is, how do you get it? Did you try my test file? And it wasn't working? Are you on the internet? Yeah. Then I would have to say you're a liar. <laughs> I will come look, I'll come look at your file as soon as I'm done. But yeah, it should, there should be no reason because I really am, have tried a bunch of uh, spots. But um, we might try actually downloading the tiny MC code uh, locally and then loading it in there. That might be one way of doing it. But I find it's problematic hitting their CDN. But I thought in this simple test case, it should work. But if anybody has trouble, just let me know. Again, email me. I'll update it, and we'll figure it out. And that'll be fun. I actually consider this stuff fun. So that's my delusion. Anybody else? Anybody want to see the worst CMS I ever created? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hold on to your hats, because this is nuts. I, and Angela's here, and she knows what I went through. So this is what we're going to create. This is the templates. I have a lesson overview. It has seven steps. And then it has an upcoming task. It has, has an overview image. And then it has the steps. So I have steps, seven of them. And then each step has an, uh, as many sub-steps as you want. One, two, three. And you notice each sub-step, you have to have the ability to have some bold text because you've got to continually yell at people if they're going to understand. Uh, this is an amazing course, by the way. You should check it out. And then you want the ability to put a chunk of code in every now and again in a subset so that you can just copy this and paste it into your calculation window or into your script window. Is that pretty cool? And so it has to know that this is not to be numbered. This one, I would pick our numbering back up. We're at substep five. And then I have to be able to have an image. And this image should be able to be centered or left adjustified. And then every now and again, we got a step, a substep, and a sub sub step. And have you ever, what's that movie where they have the dreaming with the thing and you go? Inception. Okay, welcome to my version of Inception. So if you're going to make this in the CMS, I can see all my courses and my lessons and my overview. I'll open up this one. And so far, so good. I have my overview, my overview. I can hit my test button, see the image. And I can see simply here that there are seven steps. Let's take a look. I hit the seven steps. Now I'm in the dream. And I have all of these steps. I can number them. I can change the order of them. And I can notice that they have the ability to have a WYSIWYG for the optional text. I do have these paste buttons because I found it's really good to clean up people's text as you bring it in. So I want to remove style. I want to remove uh, all the extra return characters they might have at the end. All super basic FileMaker-y stuff you guys know how to do. And then look, I know exactly how many sub-steps there are. And I click on these. Now I'm in sub-step heaven. And now I have a, uh, 
a, a WYSIWYG for each one of these. Again, a very simple code in each one, calling each field. I'll save those changes. And I see that I have a different types of the sub-steps, text, image, or code. So I come down here. Let me find one that has uh, an image. This has an image, and I can make it left or center justified. And if, to get the image, all they have to do is tell me what lesson, what step, and what sub-step, and I'll build the URL for them. Uh, so less error, error, error creation. And then uh, where's a code one? Here's a code. And it's a code one. Yeah, let me close that. The code one, this is going to be formatted differently on the web page so that they can actually copy it and it won't have any extra HTML code in it. And then anytime I want, I can go into one of these fields and create the numbered list and create my sub sub step. And technically, you could create a, a sub 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 sub. Uh, and then when you're done, that's when you, you know, you, the way you're like in a chair and you kick backwards to wake up. You wake up from the first dream and then the second dream and then you're back to there and it ends up publishing this great list. And I said, that's not worth it. Because uh, that's so much work and someone to put in everything in all those fields. It seems like a lot of work when they're starting off with a finished thing. But I really wanted, two reasons to do it is they wanted that amount of control over the formatting so that this is a way to force it into super, super clean HTML, that CSS Zen Garden standard, uh, so that uh, the web designer can just adjust the CSS and it'll work. There's no screwy stuff going on. But also, so when I come in and we want to do a localization, it's not important for the Japanese version to go through all those steps. They just want to, they want to localize the whole big chunk of code. That's going to be easier for them. So I'm going to change my language to Japanese, and I go to templates, and I open that same course, and I see instead of giving me the steps list, I now see it actually has the entire code built and has it a chunk. So this way I could take the English, send it off to them at an export, and then I get their adjusted code back and I can just import it into the new lessons and I don't have to do any data entry. They don't have to either. And now we have something that can be published and is done for Japanese. And any changes they need to make, they can make in the HTML code. Just kind of open up the window for them to inject a code that I don't like. But um, they've been given the rules. They've already gotten a super, super clean version. And so once we did one localization, I realized this is a big deal. This would be a real pain in the neck if you had to do it with HTML pages and kind of gave me that little victory. So overall. It's worth it, Angela? Worth it? Okay. All right. And I hope today was worth it to you. And I uh, hope you all have positive things to say in the evaluation. So go enjoy the rest of your day here at the park. All right. Thanks.